This is Story Theory Episode 3. Watch the previous episodes if you haven't yet. In this episode, I'll be going over narrative techniques. These are basically special moves that writers use to enhance their writing. The story can be good by just mastering the four pillars, but narrative techniques add flair to the story. I'll start with the types of talking, dialogue and monologue. Dialogue is a conversation between at least two people, while monologue is a speech where only one person talks. It can be to others, but it's not a back and forth. Inner monologue is the thought that characters have in their head. All of these can be used to deliver exposition or develop characters. How to make these interesting and engaging is another topic that I'll eventually analyze in the future. The Monogatari series and Bunny Girl Senpai are two anime that do this extremely well. The next technique is point of view. This is basically what character a scene is following. The POV doesn't always have to be the protagonist. This technique can be used to strategically give or withhold information from the viewers or create a certain effect. For example, if I wanted to make the hero protagonist feel like a menacing figure towards the villains of the story, I could have the scene be from the villain's POV as the hero takes them down and leaves them in fear. Another example is if I have a mystery story and one of the characters knows the answer to the mystery, I could avoid showing their POV to keep the audience out of the loop. Next is backstory, which is the events that happened to the character before the plot began. This can be used to develop characters and setting. Anime like the Big Three and many battle manga use this technique exceptionally. Next is flashback and flash forward. These are scenes where the story temporarily moves back or forward in time. Flashbacks can be used to show backstories, remind the audience of scenes that have happened, or add a new event that happened off screen. Flash forwards can be used to get the audience excited for an upcoming event, create mystery, or serve as a hook, which is something that captures the audience's attention. Next is in media rays. This is a technique where the story starts in the middle of an event. This can be a flash forward or the story can just continue from there and fill in the audience on the details later. The technique is also used as a hook to immediately get the audience's attention. Like a flash forward, it can also create mystery. Next is show don't tell. This is a technique where instead of using exposition to get a point across, they use imagery and visual examples. For example, instead of saying the room was messy, the writer would describe multiple specific examples of how the room was messy. Next is foreshadowing. This is when the writer hints at something before it happens in the story. Foreshadowing can be executed through speech, narration, or even visuals. Foreshadowing can be helpful for making plot twists more digestible, but it doesn't automatically mean that the plot twist is well written. Next is Chekhov's gun. This is essentially a higher level of foreshadowing. The quote associated with this is, if in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one, it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. End quote. This ties into my theory of stories being chains of setups and payoffs. The gun on the wall is the setup. The firing of the gun is the payoff. Using this technique requires planning and foresight in one story and is extremely satisfying to see. Next is Red Herring. This is basically a foreshadowing fake out. The writer makes it seem like X is being hinted at being Y, but in reality, X is not Y. These are effective distractions and mysteries to keep the audience on their toes and in suspense until you reveal the answer. Next is Audience Surrogate. This is a character that is in the same position as the audience knowledge-wise. The primary purpose is for delivering exposition. For example, if the story is fantasy or sci-fi, the writer has to explain the setting and the unique functions. So the writer will have an audience surrogate who's as ignorant as the audience and have another character explain everything to them. This is superior to simply expositing with narration because it feels more natural. Next is Four Corner Opposition. This is a technique defined by John Truby in The Anatomy of Story for Building Conflict. This is a technique where the protagonist is pitted against the antagonist and secondary opponents. An example from Hamlet is where Hamlet is the hero. Claudius is the main opponent, and Gertrude and Polonius are secondary opponents. Each opponent should use a different way of attacking the hero's greatest weakness. John Truby says to place all characters in conflict with each other. He also says to put the values of all four characters in conflict. Think of a cluster of values for each character. Each value has a positive and negative side, which can then be used as a mistake as they fight for what they believe in. For example, determined and aggressive, or honest and insensitive. More advice he has is push the characters to the corners. Make each character be as different as possible. Extend the four corner pattern to every level of the story, like institution, family, society, etc. For example, the Iliad has four corner opposition within the Greeks and within the world. Seven Samurai has it within the Samurai and within the world. A New Hope and Batman Begins are other movies I've seen using this. Next is Deus Ex Machina. This is actually a technique that should be avoided. Oxford defines it as an unexpected power or event saving a seemingly hopeless situation, especially as a contrived plot device in a play or a novel. The reason it should be avoided is because it often goes against my narrative chain method. 
For recap, a narrative chain is a chain of setups ending with a payoff. All chains belong to one of the four pillars of story. I explained this in episode 1, but I only now gave it a name. With a deus ex, the solution of the problem usually doesn't stem from one of the several chains being set up. It often comes out of left field. A deus ex could be foreshadowed, but that doesn't make it much better. For example, watch my video on Jojo Part 5's ending, where I explain how the stand arrow is a deus ex machina. Next is unreliable narrator. This is self-explanatory. It is a narrator that gives the audience false information. This can be used to sustain mystery and control the amount of correct knowledge that the audience has. Next is juxtaposition and foils. Juxtaposition is defined as the fact of two things being seen or placed close together with contrasting effect. This can be done for characters, setting, themes, and even plots. For example, the Soul Society arc and Arankar arcs in Bleach are juxtaposed, and so are the settings for Soul Society and Waco Mundo. There are two main ways I know how to juxtapose. The first is by having two things be complete opposites, which I'll call total juxtaposition. The second is by having two things be similar except for one difference, which I'll call minimal juxtaposition. Characters are the main conduit for this technique, and when they are, they are called foils. Things that can be juxtaposed in a character are designs, personality traits, philosophy, and skill sets. An example of total juxtaposition is Superman and Lex Luthor. The former is extremely powerful and virtuous while the latter is physically average but extremely intelligent and evil. This type can force both characters into uncomfortable situations, especially in terms of their skill sets and positions. Superman can't just punch his way through problems that Lex poses, and Lex has to find creative ways to take down Superman. An example of minimal juxtaposition is Robin and Slade in Teen Titans. Both have similar fighting styles, don't trust anyone, and are obsessive with their objectives. The story explicitly points out how alike they are, even having Robin eventually become Slade's apprentice. This is used to highlight one of Robin's traits, which is that he has friends and he eventually has to put more trust in them. Next is metaphor. Metaphors and similes are more easily applicable in text-based stories, but they can be used in visual stories as well. A metaphor is basically when one thing symbolizes another thing. For example, Naruto's conflict with Kurama can be seen as a metaphor for his inner demons, and once he conquers them, his chakra mode symbolizes that he's overcome it. In Avatar, Zuko's struggle with lightning bending is a metaphorical representation of a struggle with his identity. Next is allegory. This is when a story is a metaphor for an idea or person. For example, early Dragon Ball was an allegory for Journey to the West. Tokyo Ghoul, specifically Kaneki's life, is potentially an allegory for Metamorphosis by Kafka, and Vash the Stampede from Trigun is potentially an allegory for Jesus. Next is Subversion. This is a technique where the writer builds up to one thing, but then resolves the chain in an unexpected way. The writer makes us have expectations based on the conventions and tropes in other stories, but then subverts them. This is a dangerous technique because it can easily mess up a story if the subversion is prioritized against the narrative chain. With narrative chains, when things in the pillars are set up, the audience has some kind of expectation for how it'll be resolved. For example, if a character wants to get revenge, we expect that they will, but the main point of subversion is to lead the setups down one path and then change direction for the payoff. This can result in a disappointing payoff or the lack of one entirely. So if I set up a character's journey, but then suddenly kill them off before they can complete it, I subvert your expectations, but at what cost? The cost is a lack of a payoff, catharsis, resolution, and satisfaction. And according to my application of narrative chains, this is bad writing, regardless of how realistic it is. Realistic writing isn't synonymous with good writing. Finally, deconstruction. Deconstruction is an incorrect word that defines a technique for idiots that think subverting tropes of a genre or putting them in a realistic light makes you an elite writer. It doesn't. Stop using it and stop using the word. Those are all the important narrative techniques that I could think of. In the next episode, I'll be analyzing topics and discussions around storytelling. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and help me revolutionize the manga industry by buying my manga and spreading the word. All important links will be in the description.